I'm sure everyone will receive these materials differently, especially the information in this interview. I would remind you that the emotional and feeling world is a functional implant, and the emotions we attribute to our heart or soul, are not truly coming from those sources. Then, where do they come from? The layer of the mind known as the unconscious generates emotions, but they are felt throughout the human body. The unconscious layer of the mind is interdimensional, so it extends from bubble 1 to bubble 2, which allows you to feel in the astral world or afterlife. When I express any of the heart virtues, I place them through the lens of oneness and equality. That's where they achieve their potency and expression. Then I take that experience, and quite literally send it to my head region, imagining that experience is placed in the pineal gland, in the center of the brain. This is my way of mailing it to everyone, through the unconscious mind. Why do you call them heart virtues if emotions are generated by the unconscious? The heart is a metaphor for the portal within each individual. It is relatively free of the human 2.0 interface and mind functional implants, partly because of the electromagnetic field it produces, and partly because of its physical dynamics. The wing makers suggest that the heart virtue should be experienced and expressed first in this region of the body, instead of the mind or head region, as a way to isolate the tendency of the mind to simulate these emotions from the unconscious mind layer, where they, by definition, lack the same potency of expression, because they exist in separation. It sounds kind of complicated. I prefer to look at the flip side. If I do nothing, if I go sit quietly, in my chair and meditate, or study religious scripture, or pray, how am I supporting the progress of this reality? If this world remains ensnared in deception, that's complicated, not just for me, but every being in bubbles 1 and 2. One of the things you've mentioned frequently is this notion of oneness and equality. I understand the meaning and import of the words, but these are certainly not new concepts. Doesn't every spiritual teacher say this? Not all, but some do. You can go back 2,500 years to Heraclitus, who announced that all things are one. It is an important concept of human philosophy, and to some extent modern-day physics. With regard to religions, often the founder says one thing, and the followers, who organize and interpret the founder's words and teachings, alter it, but oneness and unity have not been mainstays of religion, particularly in the context of behaviors. The wing makers are focused on behavioral intelligence, expressed through the lens of oneness and equality. The I am, we are, is rooted in this principle. It may not seem like a big deal to adopt this simple philosophical perspective, and frankly, it isn't, because they're simply words and it's only a concept, but if it's genuinely adopted and anchored in the core of your belief system, then you can possess the necessary commitment to express this in your behaviors. And this is where most people will probably have a problem. The human 2.0 interface is full of programming from Marduk and the human unconscious. It is weighed down in this quagmire like a person caught in quicksand struggling to find a rope or anything solid to pull themselves out. The rope in this case, is the simple framework of I am, we are, and applying it through our behaviors, but it has to line up. If you adopt the framework, but your behaviors do not reflect this, the rope disappears. The unification of all beings in all dimensions exists. It's only when you step out of quantum space-time, that you realize the illusion of separation, and retaining this basic truth of oneness and equality in a human 2.0 spacesuit, is no simple task. That's why it must be more than words, and the words must be practiced in the now. Why are the wingmakers doing it this way? It seems so innocent, I mean, asking people to become self-aware, and practice insertive and resistive behaviors. After hearing all of what's happening in the triad of power, it seems like we're using slingshots against their stealth bombers. They want a money system that makes us perpetually indebted, slaves to the dollar, and they want this money system to be one currency. The most powerful people on the planet with access to the best technology, the best weapons, how can we expect to prevail if they want transhumanism? To understand why the wing makers are focused on the sovereign integral process, you first need to understand why the triad of power is focused on their plan. The triad of power believes their one world concept is the right concept. They want to unify humanity through a money system that they control, utilizing technology as another means to unify. Unity, in their minds, is more like shepherding the human herd into easy-to-manage corrals and monitoring them for any rebellion. Their form of unity is a chimera. It is theater for display purposes, and nothing more. Their form of 
We're all in this together, let us protect you, is simply more illusion and deception. Their plan for Human 3.0 remains fused to the same functional implants, the Constitute Human 2.0, and that is separation. As I said earlier, they are here to prepare for Anu's return, whether they are conscious of it or not. All aspects of the power system, including major religions, are here to prepare. That is their watchword, prepare. The Anunnaki have one dominant belief in humanity, we are weak, because we live in fear, and separation. We do not stand up to the drip 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 of indoctrination, or the slow, but persistent evaporation, of our personal liberties. Now, remember that the Anunnaki, and their triad of power are both calculating and patient. What they established in our distant past, is beginning to come to fruition. The finite, 70 year life of a human being lacks patience. It is programmed to be impatient. This is against infinite beings, that see timelines in hundreds of thousands of years, and can program individual human beings within those timelines, to achieve precisely what they want, if human beings agree to it, if they don't stand up. The Anunnaki do not embrace a sovereign integral process. The notion of oneness and equality seems like a weakness to them. They believe they have the upper hand in this chess match. They foresee checkmate. Humans will fold. The sacrifice of Princess Diana last August was symbolic of the vibrant queen being lost on the chessboard. Those are the kind of messages they make, the kind of bold announcements. They do this out of a feeling of certainty in their programming, and patience. When I say programming, I don't mean just the internal interface that Marduk has programmed, but also the programming of the unconscious mind through the media, culture, religion, politics and economic structure. The combination of these forces is really the cause of their confidence, because they see our fall as an inevitability. Now, to answer your question, human beings, even those with Anunnaki DNA, can become self-realized of their true nature through a simple process. It doesn't require that they meditate and pray all day, or retreat to an ashram. The sovereign integral process becomes a natural part of the life expression of the individual. If enough human beings can embrace this process, or something like it, the crack in the wall will expand, the wall will become less stable, and the world of separation, in its brittleness, will begin to crumble. The life essence is what we have on our side. This is not a slingshot as you put it. It is the infinite force that powers every object in the universe. Life is inside us, and it exists in one and only one state. Equality and oneness. The entire hologram of deception, as created, and curated by the Anunnaki and their cohorts, that is not life, it is the exemplar of separation. Life is truthful and authentic. Separation begets deception, unworthiness and fear. If enough human beings awaken, if we begin to realize what's afoot, what plans are being made to further enslave us, and ensure that we remain a part of the hologram of deception, life will move inside us and we can collectively stand up and stop this, but it has to be done in the right way, with honesty, forgiveness and compassion. The alternative to separation must be expressed in our movements and practices. We have to model these behaviors as a collective entity. That is the definition of the grand portal. You've talked a lot about separation. Can you elaborate on why this concept is so prevalent? If you look at the material that comes from religion, spirituality, philosophy, psychology, even the arts, you will see that much of this material is designed to be an owner's manual for our functional implants. They support the human 2.0 interface. They instruct us on the methods and attitudes to activate these systems inside us. I've previously mentioned the three layers of the consciousness interface, the conscious mind, the subconscious and the unconscious. The unconscious is where we mostly operate in terms of our behaviors and perceptions. The unconscious mind layer is deep and penetrating, and it is universal. As I said, it's how Anu uses the oneness concept to his benefit. We are one in separation. The unconscious mind is one. Separation is a fractal energy. It infects everything within the hologram of deception to such a degree that it's not recognizable. No matter how well-intentioned a person or organization might be to convey true information, what often lurks behind the information is this fractal energy of separation, and its use of comparison and judgment, and all the other tools of separation, that distill down to fear and unworthiness. It's as if the internal programming of Marduk, and the external programming of the triad of power, echoes around in all content of all times and cultures, so common and accepted, 
as to be unnoticeable. We have accepted separation because it seems normal. Thus our behaviors and perceptions, driven largely by the unconscious mind, embody separation, and the vast majority of us do not even know it. Okay, but then how do we become aware of it? A person must understand that they are being programmed, that's a starting point. If you don't accept this basic premise, then why would you choose to change? If you do, then observe the programming inside you, within others in your environment, the larger world, and begin to see how subtle this programming is. In many ways, to observe this programming requires us to be neutral, so we can simply observe our internal states and the messages therein, as well as those of the external program, which come via television, the internet, email, newspapers, magazines, direct mail, and so on. It isn't critical that you know how every program is expressed into your life or what its esoteric meaning is. What's important is that you understand you are being programmed and you seek an internal source of direction, inspiration and movement. The sovereign integral process is focused on you, the individual, directing your own self, life essence, to express itself in oneness and equality. That's it. If you do this, then you are releasing the hold of the programming. For some this can be done quickly and for others it might require more diligent practice. Can I do this and still be a Christian or whatever I was raised in? I suggest that anyone who resonates with this information, try it out. See how it moves them through their life path. If they want to remain in their current structures, see if elements of the sovereign integral process could be applied. But if you don't see separation in your current practices, then stay there, because you won't have the motivation to be a practitioner. But you just said that most of us don't see separation. I said that if you don't see it in your current practice, then you won't be motivated to change. This process is all about change. Make no mistake about it. It is not selfish in any way. There is no burrowing into the bedrock of a belief system here, that will make you feel superior, or privileged, or wise. There really is no belief system here, other than the sovereign integral process. There is no structure, no organization, no master, no hierarchy, no one is above another or below another. Do you see? This is not an organization of this world. It cannot be of this world. Otherwise it is subject to separation. The only way the human 3.0 SI manifests, is inside enough human beings who exemplify this process who anchor this new consciousness of conduct on this planet, and share it through their behaviors and unconscious mind. That's the only way, and not everyone is prepared to do that. What happens if we see separation, but still don't have the motivation to make the changes in our behaviors? The functional implants of the human 2.0 interface are seldom easy to release. They will hold on to your life essence as long as they can. They want to drive the human vessel, not hop in the backseat and watch as mere passengers. That's against their program. So talk about this resistance from the functional implants. How does it manifest? I'm sure it's an individual thing. I don't pretend to know how it is for anyone else. I can tell you from personal experience that I initially dived head first into this process, and rearranged my life. I thought I was doing a good job, and then a week or two later, I found myself back to square one, exactly where I'd started. It felt like amnesia. It was as if I had forgotten I was even doing a new practice. Admittedly, in my case, I had a lot of distractions in my life, but everyone can probably say the same thing. So I think this tendency, to return to the habits of the consciousness system inside our 2.0 interface, is the main way that resistance is expressed. Change, of the scope, is not an easy proposition. The human 2.0 mind doesn't like the back seat. So what did you do, to return to the sovereign integral process? Well, for me, I needed to direct the techniques inward. Explain what you mean. I was directing the hard virtues outward to others, but I wasn't turning them inward to myself. It dawned on me that the inward was probably the most important place to start. How did you do that? It takes great alertness to live and express in the now. Human beings have a tendency to live in our past memories or future concerns. This was what I was doing and it took me from the now. And the now is where our life essence expresses. It isn't in the past or future, only the consciousness framework pivots between past and future, so if you find yourself in there, you know you are not in your essence. When I realized this, I read from the Wingmaker's philosophy that breath was the magnet of nowness. It was the element that brought the human being into nowness by being aware of their breathing. 
I also learned that there were different kinds of breathing that enabled this sense of nowness to penetrate more vividly into the hologram of deception.